Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, we'll continue looking at uh, Daniel 11, verse 19. Uh, still lots that we have to sort out. But uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the light that you have given us, the things you are teaching us, and for the way that your Holy Spirit works upon our heart and brings conviction and power. And um, we know, Lord, that uh, there's much work that you have to do in our lives, so we submit our hearts to you, our lives to you, and we just ask that uh, the time that we spend studying your word will strengthen us and encourage us. We pray for all those searching for truth, that you can lead and guide them. And we ask for your angels' care and protection today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning again. And uh, <clears throat> so I I've been researching some of this, uh, dealing with this history. So th there's, there's just some things here that I don't... Um, so, for instance, Caesar's assassination. So I've been reading up on that, watching some documentaries on it. Um, it's kind of interesting. Um, and I've been trying to figure out about th this and he shall fall and not be found part of it. And I still have not been able to make uh, how that would be applied to Caesar. Now, what ends up happening to Caesar is, of course, we know there's 23 uh, stab wounds. Right. And um, and then they're going to have a funeral, Caesar's funeral. And uh, as at his funeral, there's going to be a riot and uh, the mob is going to take Caesar's body. They're going to make an impromptu uh, funeral pyre and, uh, and and burn his body. And, and maybe that's what it could be referred to. But I don't I don't see that that makes sense. I mean, <clears throat> so, so this stumbling, this falling and not being found, that's, that's the thing that sort of uh, puzzles me about Caesar and how we would understand this. Now, um, now if we look at this at uh, Julius Caesar, we're saying, eh, you know, right now, just what we have in red there is just tentative, you know, Bush second under the papacy. Um, so we really try to understand this historical application first. Um, so Julius Caesar, he, he's going to go back to his own land, right? And that's where he's going to basically, he, he's in the process of making himself a king. That's the concern, right? And so, but he shall stumble and fall. So we know that uh, uh, pride goeth before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And, you know, this would apply there. So that fall uh, could apply to that. Now, um, we had some other ideas about stumbling. So one of the things about stumbling, um, uh, we, we had this somewhere else. Um, I'm, and I'm trying to remember it. Um, but, but you know, we, we have it somewhat with the image, right? The statue. There's that application there. The end of... You know, the kingdoms, it, this, the stone smites the foot of the image and, and the image falls, you know, Daniel chapter two, that sort of idea. Um, now, yeah. As a question, since, you know, we're also not only looking at the stumbling and falling, but not be found. Mm -hmm. Do Job 20 verse eight, Psalm 37, 36 and Ezekiel 26, 21, help shed any light on this. Okay, so it was Job 20, verse 8? Yes. He shall fly as a dream and shall not be found. Right, so that's one of the verses that has the same expression. Yea, he shall be chased away as a vision of the night. Now, um, so the context here, of course, this is one of Job's friends. Um and he's he's talking here uh, about the wicked, right? So I'm um, just reading through it quickly. <clears throat> the triumph of the triumphing in the verse five of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite but for a moment. 
uh, though his excellency mount up to the heavens and his head reach unto the clouds, that he shall perish forever like his own dung. Uh, they which have seen him shall say, where is he? He shall fly away as in a dream and shall not be found. Yea, he shall be chased away as a vision of the night. I also which saw him shall see him no more, neither shall his place any more behold him. So, um, I mean, definitely there could be an application there. Uh, just that this represents somebody who has, you know, exalted himself, but in the end, you know, he's not going to be found, right? In the, in the same sense that, you know, it's, it's the end of his life, right? Okay. So there could be that sort of direct application. Now, the right. other one is, um, there was one in Psalms and one in Ezekiel. Yeah, go to the Ezekiel 26, 21 first. Okay. So in Ezekiel, it says, I will make thee a terror and thou shalt be no more, though thou shalt, that, though thou be sought for, yet shalt thou never be found again, that the Lord God. And, and this is a reference to, um, uh, this is the lamentation for, um, Tyre, the, or the, which is, um, I'm just trying to see if this is for Tyre for Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar is going to come up on Tyrus. So it's the prophecy against Tyre. And it's a lamentation. It says, when I shall bring thee down with them that descend into the pit with the people of old time, and shall set thee in the low parts of the earth in places desolate of old, with them that go down to the pit, that thou be not inhabited, and I shall set glory in the land of the living. Yeah, so this refers to somebody who has died as well, right? So the idea of not being found, and now this is symbolic, of course, to Tyre, in a sense, being a city, but represented as a person that's died. Okay, so this never being found has to do with death. Right? Is that how right. you Probably should have put this on the screen for you guys to see. But. Okay, and then the other one is um, was Psalms. Which one? I I'm looking at Psalms thirty seven thirty six because that's what the translator said used. But I'm I'm trying to figure that one out. There's anything there? Well, thirty seven thirty six reads: Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's the same idea, um, you know, the same expression in Hebrew. I've seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yeah, I sought him, but he could not be found. So, so this is again talking about the wicked, the death of the wicked. Um, if you go back to 34, uh, it says, wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. If the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. I've seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Right. So just going back here a bit more. Right. So this is a contrast between the righteous and the wicked. Okay. Okay. So, so the idea then applying this to the death of Caesar makes sense. Right. We can say it's consistent with other scriptures. So the stumbling and falling and not being found, this would refer to as death if we compared it. Right. So does that seem clear? I mean, the situation with Caesar, he stumbled when he went into his relationship with Cleopatra. Yeah. He fell when he was stabbed. Yeah. And after that point, he was no more. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's his end. Right. 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 Yeah. Well, the stumbling, of course, Cleopatra, it, it, you know, it could be just the stumbling and the falling is just has to do with the um, what ends up happening when he is killed, because there is uh, it sort of does happen. There's going to be this uh, struggle with. Um, uh, I can't think of the guy's name. Brutus. No, not first. Okay. It's going to be the that attacks him from behind. Um, Brutus is going to be later. But anyway, I can't remember which one it was that stabbed him first. 
or attempted to stab him, but basically just kind of cut him. Um, uh, so, uh, so there's, so he, you know, he's lying down, he's stumbling, he does stumble and fall, he gets a cut in his leg, right? And then, you know, then he's going to be killed and then he's not going to be found, right? Because he's going to be dead. So, um, so this makes sense applying this to Caesar as, as we have. The difficulty then becomes when we make an application to our time, right? To understand what is here occurring. Because, you know, we still, with this Julius Caesar, I mean, we know it has to do with Rome, right? But here in this case, because we have, we have this application of the presidents of the United States, uh, George W., Obama, and Trump, um, that has been made by Jeff in the past. And, and so we're examining that. Can we put Bush the second there? Um, and that what ends up happening with, uh, with, you know, Bush's presidency ending, how would that be aligned to a stumbling and a falling and not be found? Right. Right. So that would be the problem. You know, how would we apply that? And, and maybe we can't, right? So maybe there's there's something about this application uh, that wouldn't make sense, except we do have some very strong reasons to have Obama being the raiser of taxes and Augustus, uh, um, or Tiberius, pardon me, being Trump, right? So Augustus being Obama and Tiberius being Trump makes sense. That's why this application was made. So, and we have here, you know, some things mixed in, in the, in the bold, uh, in the brackets there, which is Swearingen. So then we have to uh, try to understand w what's happening. Now, when, when Caesar is assassinated, after he's assassinated, um, they're going to have this whole negotiation of what to do, uh, with the government. So there's the conspirators, there's 60 of them. Um, and uh, you got uh, Mark Anthony and you have Lepidus. Um, Lepidus is, has a legion that he's commanding. Um, and they're going to have the Senate meet and they're going to, you know, all the conspirators are going to be given amnesty, right? So they're not going to be charged. They're going to continue. They're going to uh, ratify all the laws made by Caesar, by uh, Julius Caesar. So um, because... They're, they were popular, all these different reforms. One of them was the Julian calendar. So, I mean, if they hadn't have ratified uh, the Julian calendar, you know, we would end up with some other kind of calendar. Um, so there's these types of things that happen with the death of Caesar. But how could we equate this with Bush II? And, and, and it's Bush II under the papacy. How does Obama becoming president, how does that have anything to do with this? And then it says, you know, then she'll stand up in his, that is Caesar's estate, a raiser of taxes. Now, in some ways, uh, when we look at, at Caesar, I mean, of course, this is going to be, um, Octavian, right? So that's his nephew. I think Octavian, when Julius Caesar is killed, is 18 or something like that. And, and the will, he's, he's basically given like 70% of Caesar's estate and it becomes the, the heir to the estate. Now, Caesar's going to give a lot of money to, to the common people, something like three months, months wages. There's a bunch of things that happen. Uh, but, uh, and, you know, and Octavian isn't there at the time because he's, he's off, um, so there's a campaign that Julius Caesar was going to join him in. Um, but they didn't end up having the campaign because Julius Caesar is killed. So, so there's a lot of stuff that happens there. And, and then you're going to have, uh, this, uh, triumvirate, uh, that's going to, uh, be in place before, uh, you know, Augustus Octavian becomes, uh, you know, the first emperor, right? So there's going to be this period of time from the death of Julius Caesar, uh, 
to the rise of Octavian as Caesar Augustus. And, and this doesn't really say much about it. I mean, uh, I mean, obviously, then she'll stand up in his, his estate, Caesar Augustus. So, I mean, that's pretty, a pretty brief description for that history that happens there. And the question is, why does it say it that way? Now, part of it, if we go back to this, this reference to the cross in verse 18, I mean, the whole issue here has to do with Rome's interaction with God's people, right? Or with all these nations' interactions with God's people. And of course, this taxation that occurs at the time uh, when Christ is born, I mean, that's that's the main reason why we have Augustus here. And then same with Tiberius. He's going to be the king when Jesus is crucified. So they're going to have this history of these this nation that has come in contact with God's people and these these wars that relate in some way to God's people. Right. So it's not necessarily going to go into the details of, you know, what happens in all this Roman history. Right. That's why it's not going to mention, you know, uh, the triumvirate. Right. So we have things in our history that, uh, um, you know, we'd have to address as well. So so we got Bush the second. So he's going to be Julius Caesar. He stumbles and falls. He's not found. How would we apply that to Bush the second? Would it be just, you know, he only has a four year term. He just does four years and then loses to Obama. Is there something no. else here? Bush the second had eight years. Oh, he had eight years. You're right. I'm thinking of the first one. So yeah, so he had eight years. Okay. So I'm... yeah, so he had eight years. So and that's because nine eleven actually helped him quite a bit. Right. So when he loses to Obama, yeah, the reason why uh, the Republicans are unpopular had to do with the war in Iraq. So uh, even though initially Americans were uh, quite gung ho uh, to get back at whoever had caused uh, what happened at 9 11, uh, many Americans felt that uh, the war on Iraq was sort of misplaced. Is that correct? Is that? That's, I, <clears throat> I, I would say yes. Yeah, okay. So I remember the, what I heard in the news back then. Um, uh, you know, especially the popular media made that war very unpopular. Okay. Now, so then you're going to have Obama. So I, I'm not sure how we would address then what happens to Bush the second as this parallel. And, and then we have Bush the second under the papacy, right? So obviously it's Julius Caesar as an individual. Now we're saying it's more, more something that happens under the papacy. So I'm sort of at a loss to try to explain this myself. I don't, I don't really have any good answers for this. You know, and I've tried looking at some of these Hebrew numbers and say, well, you know, what if I put this when, you know, now the period of time that, that, uh, Bush is, um, uh, you know, his term, I guess, because he's going to get elected on November 7th. Well, the election is on November 7th in um, 2000, right? That's when the election occurs. But it's it's a bit delayed. It's challenged. Yeah, it's challenged. And, and he's he runs against the guy, uh, whatever his name was. Uh, um, that was Clinton's vice president uh, that felt that he's the one that invented the Internet. Yeah, Gore. Yeah. He invented the Internet? No, he believes he, he invented the Internet. Oh, yeah. uh, how, how did he do that? In his own mind. <laughs> yeah, so how long did it take? It was quite a while before... Um, well, the election occurred in November. Yeah, November 7th. There was a huge issue with this 
because of the what they called the hanging chads in the state of Florida. Right. So Florida had this this issue of they had to count all the ball ballots and have to decide which ones are are valid and which ones aren't of the ballots. Yeah. So, okay. <clears throat> and then it was um, he was then it uh, basically Al Gore just uh, conceded the election at some point. I'm looking very quickly to see exactly what this was, but it was uh, Bush winning in Florida by a margin of 0.009%. So it's one of the it had to do, I'm sorry, brother. Um, do I, it had to do with the electorates. They, um, the electorates on it, they had a big um, constitutional issue of that. Right. Because Bush at that point won 271 electoral votes, which is only one more than the 270 necessary to win. So it was indeed the closest election that we've ever had. Yeah, especially when you just consider that Florida decides it in a sense. Right. Um, by such a small margin. Um, um, yeah, so... So the electoral votes of Florida, yeah, they're just, yeah, 0.009%. Um, so when does, what date does he? I'm looking. I'll try to find that. I mean, obviously, January 20th, that's when he's going to be inaugurated in uh, 2001. You know, and technically, of course, Al Gore gets more votes than a popular vote, right? 48.4 to 47.9. Yeah, I can't find here when they said this, this, he, oh, December 13th. Okay. <clears throat> December 13th. So, um, so is that 45 days ordinal and 46 days? I mean, how many days between that is that? 36 days. 36 so, days? Okay. November 7th to December 13th, 36 okay. days. November is My fault. November has 30 days, and then it's just an extra. Seven plus six is 13. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, and then you're going to have uh, January 20th. So that's going to be another additional 70. So it's altogether 74. So it's 36 and 38. 36 days, and then 38 days. The inauguration. Okay. So I'm just putting some other dates in here. So, so it's going to be, of course, September 11th is going to be the next big date, right? So in the first year of his presidency, um, says 308 days after the, the election, 272 days after he was, you know, declared president. And then 234 days after he's inaugurated, then they're going to have September 11th, 2001. So then Obama's going to be, uh, have his inauguration on January 20th, 2009, right? So eight years later. Okay. So, I mean, that's just the numbers we have. They're nothing that I see particularly, you know, the, the one thing that it's sort of interesting is from September 11th, 2001 to January 20th, uh, 2009 is 2,688 days. Um, so from 9-11 to Obama becoming inaugurated is that 2688 number that we have, right? That, that U.S. tax form. An application for an additional extension of time to file your taxes. So 16 times 168. So that, that's kind of interesting. Um, because one of the things is we do have 911 in this line here, right? So we have, um, under Bush the second, you're going to have uh, the papacy taking over the United States and then two, 2,600 and 88 days later, Obama is inaugurated. So, so that's kind of interesting. Okay. Now, um, so when we look at this, then, okay, let's think about this. 
Um, so when we're going back here in this whole history, we have uh, he pagan Rome, right? So where they were saying just pagan Rome re represents the papacy. Uh, he's going to end up conquering uh, the king of the north, right? Seleucid Syria, U.S., and does it according to his own will. Now that's going to be um, we're connecting this with December 25th, 1991, right? So um, when we when we looked at this, so we were dealing with um, the king of the south and the king of the north, right? There's this battle going on, right? And, and they're going to overthrow uh, atheistic communism. Egypt is going to be overthrown, right? This is going to be done by the king of the north. And... We know that in, in verse 14, that the reason why Rome exalts itself to establish the vision is it's supporting Egypt. Not that it cares about Egypt, but it, it doesn't want to, um, you know, to see the king of the north become too powerful, right? So we can see this here that the papacy, uh, they're going to support Egypt. This is the Polish trade unions. That's how we looked at this. Okay. Um, and we can see all of these symbols dealing with the 1989, the Sunday law, the, um, the prophetic mirror, all of these symbols that we could apply to that history. Okay. And then the King of the North, that's Antiochus the third this time representing the USA. They come and cast up a mount. So this is going to be the economic and military pressure and take the most fenced cities, right? So what happens at, uh, in this time in 1989, uh, we're going to see, um, that the apostate Protestant churches are combining with, because they're looking at this as a good thing, right? The overthrow of the Soviet Union, they hate communism, it's atheistic, right? Uh, and then the arms of the South, uh, the Egyptian army under Ptolemy V, shall not withstand. That is, they're not going to stand up. They're going to lose the Battle of Pinion. We're saying that's November 9th, 1989, because we had the Battle of Raphia being February 15th, 1798. Right? And um, the Chosis people, the global elites, uh, they're not going to have any strength to withstand. So they're not going to stand up. Right. So both uh, uh, Soviet Union and the global elites, they're going to be basically put down, right? Now, then we have in verse 16, pagan Rome, that's the papacy, shall come against him, the United States, and do according to his own will. Now, now we put here uh, December 25th, 1991, and uh, we take this 191 B.C., this is when the papacy conquers the United States. So we're saying that that is occurring in that history from 1989, specifically once the Soviet Union falls, uh, that the papacy is working um, to become, so it's subjugating Syria and becoming the next king of the north. That is the new world order under George Bush the first. So there's going to be the 9-11-1990 speech. New World Order speech at the Joint Session of Congress. And then he, Pagan Rome, under Pompey the Great, he's going to represent the papacy, right? She'll stand in the glorious land. So this is going to be 9-11. So we can see this. there's this progression of how the papacy, once it exalts itself to establish the vision, is going to conquer the United States, Right? So it, it conquers the king of the south, but in so doing, there's this allegiance with the United States, and, and it leads to what happens at 9-11. So we're going to have uh, the Patriot Act. And, and then we have the symbol of the message to the Levites, so it's referring to our history, our movement, uh, and shall be consumed. And we looked at that um, that symbol as well, the 3615, um, nine years and three. 327 days. The Gulf War ends on February 28th, 1991 to Bush's II's inauguration on January 20th, 2001. 
That's 3,615 inclusive days. So that connects uh, Bush the first with Bush the second, right? And we have this inauguration date. Okay, so we've got to keep these things in mind. I'm going over this so that when we keep moving on and looking at how we're, we're studying this and understanding this, we can see these significant dates. Okay, so then, um, where was I here? Back here. Okay, so then we have this siege, and that relates in our history to November 19th, 2019, 10 days after November 9th. Um, and he, pagan Rome, under Julius Caesar, the papacy shall set his face to enter Egypt. So, so under Julius Caesar, we, we say it's here, the papacy, right? Um, and, and that this is the history that's happening after 9-11. Now, should we, should we, uh, maybe change that? That what we would have to say here that this isn't really just referring to the papacy, that this is referring to, because here we have Julius Caesar introduced, and we're saying he's the papacy. But later we say Julius Caesar is um, George Bush, and maybe this should be you know Bush the second under under the papacy, or combined with the papacy, or something like that. Now is in that history. Um, now he's going to enter Egypt, the UN, atheistic communism, with strength of his whole kingdom. Now, maybe this in some ways could refer to George Bush II, right? What do people think about that? So instead of having pagan Rome under Julius Caesar being the papacy, pagan Rome is now representing the United States. And that would be consistent with what we see later. You know, the United States is still somewhat connected with the papacy in this history. Any thoughts on that? So you're shifting this from Caesar Bush being equal to Caesar to Obama or what? I'm, I'm... Well, no, Julius Caesar we had as, as George Bush the second, right? right? Right. Later on, uh, you know, uh, under the papacy. And so maybe we could, you know, do this, right? So that, that he's joined with the papacy. That's the okay. idea. Because Julius Caesar representing George Bush later, it makes sense if he's still George Bush here. But this is sort of this union that had begun um, with the United States and the papacy, and it's still valid in the time of B George Bush the second. It's going to start with, with Reagan. It's going to be there with George Bush the first. Um, you know, Clinton, he's... You know, he's just interested in himself. But, uh, you know, under George Bush II, there, there's still this connection with the papacy. And, and what they're seeking to do is to control, you know, if they're going to enter into Egypt, the UN atheistic communism, with the strength of his whole kingdom. So that would be all of Caesar's military resources they have here. Um, We'd have to try to understand what this means in our history. Um, now, it says the upright ones. We're going to say the upright right ones refer to the Jews, which in our history would be the SDAs, right? And, and that this is going to be what happens um, after 9-11 or in connection with 9-11, right? So the Protestants... In spiritual formation, there's this union that occurs. So anti-patter, right? Being the, the Protestants in spiritual formation. Thus shall he do, and that is, uh, this, this is by God's providence. God has appointed by his providence. And he sh God shall give, and we said here Julius Caesar was the papacy, but we would say, I just going to push the second button. And then we'd have to understand what this daughter of woman is. And this is Cleopatra. So, so they, they enter into Egypt and God in his providence is, gives the providence, gives them the world, the UN, the dragon power, 
a corrupting her, which is going to cause her ruin or the fall of the world. Right. But the UN on its own. So she, which would then be the UN, shall not stand, neither be for him, like will not exist. Um, right. So that says stand on his side doesn't make sense in Hebrew. Um, she shall not stand. She shall not stand up and neither be, right? Neither exist. Okay. So this being the UN. So it's not going to, um, become another kingdom, right? After this, the occupation of Egypt, the conquering of atheistic communism, shall he, Caesar, and then we have the papacy. But again, this would have to be uh, Bush the second, right? Because that's who we say with the papacy instead of under, but it doesn't matter. Uh, he shall turn his face unto the isles, right? Now, we're saying that here, so I guess in this case, the UN is not going to, to be, be able to stand. And, and so this turning their face onto the Isles, the Mediterranean basin, this is basically capturing the United Nations completely and shall take many, but a prince that is Christ is mentioned here. Right. So this is going to be referring to this movement here. And then uh, Christ takes upon himself the reproach, even though he doesn't have his own reproach. And then it says, Bush the second of the pap papacy shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land. So how would we understand this then with Bush the second? If he's going to first turn his face towards the isles, and then he turns his face towards the fort of his own land. I mean, this would be uh, turning his face towards the isles. Um, we say the UN is there, you know, after 9-11, they're going to have. What does the United States do in this war in Iraq? What 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 is the whole issue about what happens? With this war, so after 9/11, what is what does George Bush do? Okay, so there is the West weapons of mass destruction. Now, I mean, I, I've never known what to believe about this. I mean, because I don't generally trust the media. Whether there was weapons of mass destruction and these were just hidden, or whether Iraq wanted them to think they had weapons of mass destruction. Uh, none of it really makes sense to me. I don't know about other people what they think about that whole issue. Any any thoughts about that? Now, uh, this war against Iraq, it's going to be it's going to begin March nineteenth, two thousand three. So we got a date uh, we can put into here. So we've had other wars that we put in. So March nineteenth, two thousand three. Hmm. So that's going to be 788 days after uh, George Bush's inauguration, 554 days after 9-11. Okay. Okay. So um, so they wanted to disarm Iraq of weapons of mass destruction and end Saddam Hussein's support for terrorism to free the Iraqi people. That was the rationale for the Iraq war. Now, now, why are they going um, against Iraq? I mean, the idea is that we had September 11th. Uh, was Iraq responsible for September 11th? I thought it had something to do with the oil. Okay, well, so, I mean, it's going to be Osama bin Laden that's the mastermind behind that. And where's where's Osama bin Laden? Where is he? Because there's... I mean, as far as I know, there's no connection between Osama bin Laden and Iraq, right? So as far as we know, there's no connection between Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden, right? So 
But at, at one time, they say here, like 70% of the Americans believe Saddam Hussein was personally involved in the 9-11 attack. And 82% of Americans believe Saddam Hussein provided assistance to Osama bin Laden. Uh, but both of these have been found to be false, according to this article. Right Now, what about the cooperation of the UN as far as... Uh, this war on Iraq. Do they have any in- involvement? This is all this old news stuff that was very confusing at the time for me. Some people have the 20th of March as the start of the war in Iraq when they started their shock and awe bombing campaign. So they have eight years, eight months, and 26 days for the war if you count from March 20th to December 15th, 2011 as the end of the war. Okay, any thoughts on this? So is this war on in, in Iraq, is this relevant uh, if we're dealing with George Bush here? And and how do we place the UN in, the, in all of this? Is this situation, I mean, you were touching briefly upon Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden. Yeah. The fact that they're both Sunni Muslims mm-hmm. is this division within Islam similar to that which we see between the North and the South and Democrats and Republicans? Um, You're talking about the Shiite and the Sunni? Yes. I don't know. Is that, you know, is this a division of ultra-conservative versus what would some would also think as being somewhat liberal? So the Sunni would be more liberal, wouldn't they? How do we approach that? I don't know, because it depends how you, you look at it. I mean, um, I don't know if it's all that clear cut. I don't know enough about, you know, all the different factions and groups with this, within Islam. I mean, I've sort of always looked at it kind of like, you know, Protestants and, and uh, uh, um, Catholics. So okay. that time. But, you know, my ignorance on Islam is is much greater than my knowledge. I mean, I know a lot about the calendars and some of the history, the rise of Islam. But as far as the religion itself, I don't have a great deal of knowledge. Now, I do know that the United Nations, they call the invasion illegal under international law, that it violated, violated the UN Charter. So that in order to get this... Um, the UK and the US had undermined the United Nations Security Council in the process of declaring war. That the process of identification for a legal basis of the war was far from satisfactory. Okay. So they didn't have weapons of mass destruction, dis- destruction, though they were seeking to, you know, explore that area that Saddam was. Yeah, I, 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 I hate things like this where it says the war killed an estimated 150,000 to 1 million and 33,000 people. That's quite a broad estimate. The war hurt United States international reputation as well as Bush's domestic popularity and public image. The war reduced Blair's popularity leading to his resignation in 2007. Now we know that that somewhat for George Bush uh, Jr. uh, because of what happened in Kuwait in 1990, that's part of what you know, that we look at his motivation for going against Iraq had to do with sort of unfinished business. Okay, so so what what could we say then about um, the United States as far as its sort of overriding the UN? Um, so going against what the UN is saying. Um, so this this war is illegal. Does that have any place in where we're looking at? Um, because we have the daughter of woman, Cleopatra, representing the world, the UN, the dragon power. Um, so is this talking about basically this battle that's going on between the United Nations and the United States? Is that kind of what the war in Iraq is about from a prophetic point of view? That's one thought. So there's this uh, dalliance between the United States and the UN, uh, where the UN is not really supporting the United States, 
right? But ultimately, um, the UN is going to be conquered to some degree, right? And that's him turning his face onto the aisles, right? Now, so the UN, I mean, obviously as an organization, it represents the world, the dragon power. Um, but it also, we know that atheistic communism moved from the Soviet Union to the UN. I mean, the UN always had that aspect to it. But as far as the leader of that, what we would call the King of the South, with the fall of the Soviet Union, that responsibility lies upon the sh shoulders of the UN, right? Uh, the globalists in the UN. The UN is a globalist organization. So, so is this making more sense or less sense? You're just presenting to us that there's a lot that we have to think through in order to be able to put this in a, a format that we can all agree on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's still lots, lots to think about in this, in this case. Now, um, so there are some symbols here that we could examine as, as far as these Jewish numbers as spans of time, which I'm going to take a look at a bit more. Once we, we start talking about the war in Iraq, we have some dates that we can put into the mix. We don't have tons of things here as far as the use of these numbers in this, in these applications, in these verses. <clears throat> but we know that if we have a George Bush setting his face to enter with the strength of his old, whole kingdom and the upright ones, that is the SDAs and the Protestants, the spiritual formation, uh, seeking to now we say here that they're that they're entering into Egypt, right? So the King of the South, that's the UN atheistic communist. Um, and, and then we would have to say, well, how does this relate to the war in Iraq? And and it could be just trying to seek to get control of the UN, right? That is the United States acting sort of independently from the UN. In, in doing, in entering into a war that, that the UN declares as illegal, does that then lead to the United States, George Bush, the second under the papacy, uh, being given the UN? Does it lead to that? Right. That's, that's what we would be looking at with these, with this verse here. So, you know, 16, 17, 18. <clears throat> Cause, you know, here, Iraq is not. The enemy, I mean, it's, it, you know, in this story, it's not one of the symbols here. The symbol here is Egypt, Egypt being atheistic communism, the United Nations. And that this war in Iraq is not really about the war in Iraq on, on this level, but is more about the United States controlling the UN. Does that make any sense at all? Now, now, what is the papacy's role as far as what happens in the war in Iraq? Weren't they in opposition to what the U.S. was doing? Well, so we know that, that the papacy was in opposition, right? Yeah, say, saying no to war. War is not, always, is not always inevitable. It is always a defeat for humanity, right? And, and we know that the papacy almost always speaks against war. So, so how do we then say George Bush under the papacy? If the papacy is opposed to what George Bush is doing, repeat that question, please. So if we're saying that Julius Caesar represents George Bush under the control of the papacy, how do we, how could we support that if the papacy is actually opposed to these actions? In the word, I don't know that we could. So you just have to say George Bush, not under the papacy. If we're going to have Joey, Julius Caesar as being George Bush. Okay. We, we Bush, Bush the first or Bush the second? Bush the second. Okay, right. So you're saying that we would do that? I'm you asking, would... I mean, because at that point, did George Bush have the full support of the U.S. and did they have any support of Rome. Okay. Well, 
So, you know, part of the problem that I have with all of this history and trying to understand it is at that time in, within Adventism, there was all kinds of false information about, you know, the connection of the papacy with the United States. That is, papacy is connected with the United States, obviously. Um, but people are constantly looking for a Sunday. So they're, they're grasping at straws, trying to find some connection that the Sunday law is imminent. You know, after 9-11, still the same, um, you know, at least groups within Adventism. So, so when we look at George Bush II here, though, and we're trying to understand, um, so he shall set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom. He's going to enter um, Egypt, right, with the strength of his whole kingdom. And the upright ones with him. So these are the Jews, Seventh-day Adventists. And, uh, and the Jewish forces loyal to Caesar led by Antipater. So we're saying that Antipater represents Protestants, right, just by the name, um, and that this is spiritual formation, right? That 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 connects the Jews with the Protestants, and and so there's this because you know the war in Iraq is a it's not the main issue really that's going on. It, it's more the external issue to what's happening within these power struggles between these different groups. So you have the United States. You have the UN, atheistic communism, and you have the papacy. These three powers are posturing and, and positioning themselves uh, so that they can ultimately control things. So, you know, what you see in the news is not necessarily what's happening behind the scenes, right? So we all know that, but we don't know what's happening behind the scenes in actuality, right? I mean, we can guess, we can have some theories and speculations, but we're not behind the scenes, right? You know, God God sees these things, and, and so, you know, they're revealed in his word, but often people have speculations that they apply uh, to God's word about what they think is going to happen or what they think has happened. But one thing we can say about uh, this war in Iraq that we know is that on the surface, the UN definitely is opposed to it, and the papacy is opposed to it. But George Bush, if he's being symbolized by Caesar, is seeking to conquer the king of the south, atheistic communism. And this war in Iraq is not the real issue, even if George Bush II thinks it is. They, they are operating in opposition to the UN. And then it says, you know, God shall give Julius Caesar, that is George Bush II, the daughter of women of the world, the UN, the dragon power, at some point, right? That That's how we would interpret this if we're going to look at what's happening. So it's seeking to conquer Julius Caesar, seeking to conquer uh, Egypt, right? Um and in that process, God is going to provide him with Cleopatra, the queen of Egypt. Right. Now, she's not going to stand. That is, she's not going to rise up as another kingdom. Because Rome is that kingdom. Right. Later on, it would be pa pa papal Rome. But right now, it's pagan Rome. And then, you know, he, we're saying that, well, that's Bush II, now turns his face towards the Isles. So when he's given this daughter of women... He's going to turn his face towards the Isles. So that's the Mediterranean Basin. And, and this does happen historically. Right. And then it's going to mention Christ in this context. Um, you know, the prince uh, shall cause to cease the reproach. OK, so it mentions this. Uh, he doesn't have his own reproach. So he's going to take the reproach upon himself, that is our reproach. So it mentions that parenthetically, we could say. And then we see Bush II turns his face towards 
the fort of his own land. But when he does so, he's going to stumble and fall. And we're saying this, this refers to the death of Julius Caesar. And how does this apply then to Bush the second? I mean, Bush the second is not assassinated. Does he stumble and fall? Is this some sort of death, you know, to, um, to something, right? Not Bush the second personally, but something that Bush the second is seeking to, to have. And then we have, then she'll stand up in his, that is Caesar's estate. So we would have to say Bush the second, a raiser of taxes, which we're saying is Obama in the glory of the kingdom, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle, right? He's going to die a peaceful death, AD 14. That is Caesar Augustus. And is in his, that is Augustus's estate or Obama's, um, she'll stand up the vile person. So that's going to be Trump, Tiberius Caesar, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peacefully at the peaceful transference of power after Augustus's death. We'd have to try to understand how that is and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of a flood shall they, alleged seditionists, be overflown from before him and shall be broken, executed, yea, also the prince of the covenant. So we need to understand how alleged seditionists, and it's kind of interesting that they have alleged seditionists because we have um, alleged seditionists in in January 6th, um, 2021. So, but we still need to understand how this applies. So, still a lot to sort out here. Any thoughts about what what I read there, how I looked at this I, line? I think a lot to sort out is quite the understatement. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm just going to put some stuff in here um, just because, you know, I want to remember it. Um, I haven't put all the Hebrew numbers in here. So I need to do that as well for these this part. I started putting them in. So we have to see, you know, what is the the crucifixion of Christ represent in this that we normally have it as the Sunday law, right? So, so maybe there's stuff that we don't understand about this history. Maybe, and maybe this application we're making doesn't make sense. Right? So, because we're not saying that this is the correct application at this point. We're trying to understand this application. And we're starting with what Jeff gave us. Right? Bush the second, Obama, and Trump being Julius Caesar, Augustus, and Tiberius. And there's a lot of things that fit. Um, there are things that still would be a puzzle to us. Now, especially when, when Jeff is going to look at this, he's going to say, well, Trump is going to be the one bringing in the, the Sunday law, right? That's how he's reading it. Now, he's not seen January 6, 2021. You know, he shall obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Now, um, this would refer to Trump's sort of charismatic power. And, and then, but we have the arms of the flood. Well, the arms of the flood, um, you know, flood normally refers to the Sunday law, right? Shall be overflown from before him and shall be broken. So we're looking at Swearingen's uh, ideas here. So, um, so I'm not really sure if I even understand how he's interpreting uh, this history um, to come peacefully. And I, I'm not really sure how he puts the alleged seditionists in here. So I haven't really understood how he's interpreting this. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to look at Swearingen's book here because um, I want to understand what he's doing. Um, I'm just going to look at this, this, idea here, the Prince of the Covenant. Okay, so here's what he says, dealing with this uh, particular so Daniel 11. Okay, so why is he... Um, I'm just going to read this little bit here. 
we got like 10 minutes left in our study. When we survey Daniel 11 overall, we find that there are certain trans- transitional texts that give a general idea where we are in the stream of prophetic history. This specific chapter will outline seven transitional texts that we can associate to a particular historical trend. Uh, the first transitional text states that, Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, right? So we're familiar with that. Um, and then they have 11.4, And when he shall stand up, the kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided towards the four winds of heaven, Alexander's kingdom. Um, and and then, then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. Um, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. And in his estate uh, shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall give, not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come and peaceably obtain the kingdom by flatteries and with the arms of the flood shall they be overflown from before him and he shall, and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. As we assess the first passage above, the physician Luke stated that the raiser of taxes uh, would be the pagan Roman emperor Caesar Augustus. He stated that it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Caesar Augustus would not die in anger nor in battle, but would die a natural death and be succeeded by Tiberius Caesar. Tiberius is the subject of the second transitional text above, who was the emperor in power when Christ, the prince of the covenant, was broken or crucified. Thus, these two passages clearly place us in the history of pagan Rome, 168 BC to 476. Our next transitional text takes us place in the historical phase of papal Roman Empire. Okay, so um, I want to deal more with what he says about this verse. I want to know what he says about these. Okay. Um, Thus the sap passage under examination can be rephrased. Then shall stand up, come to power in his, Caesar's estate, a raiser of taxes, Caesar Augustus, in the glory of his kingdom, pagan, pagan Rome. Within a few days, he, Augustus, shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle, by natural death. With his decisive naval victory over Mark Antony in the famous Battle of Actium, 31 BC, Octavian would stand up in the glory of the kingdom by completing the conquest of Hellenistic Egypt that had been initiated by Caesar, later renamed Caesar Augustus. Octavian would emerge as the undisputed ruler of the Roman world and became the first official emperor recognized by the Roman Senate in AD 27. The rise of Octavian and his crucial naval victory in the Battle of Actium will be uh, discussed in greater detail, Daniel 11, verse 25 to 28, right? So it's going to go through that history again. Um, And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, and he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. After the peaceful death of Augustus, Tiberius Caesar would become the second official Roman emperor, stemming from a noble patrician family, the Claudian clan, one of the oldest and most reputable families in Rome, Tiberius Claudius Nero would grow to earn great distinction as a military commander on the Roman frontier. Initially, Augustus had believed that as the child of his wife, Livia, from a previous marriage, his stepson Tiberius was too vile to become emperor, yet after the death of several successors, he would eventually adopt Tiberius as his own son and designate him to be the sole heir of the Roman throne. Tiberius would eventually ascend to the emperorship peaceably in a natural succession after the death of Augustus and obtain the kingdom by flatteries, receiving a fabricated and albeit artificial flattery from the Roman Senate. Yet because he was a soldier at heart and preferred the army camp over the palace, Tiberius detested dealing with the senatorial hierarchy and never could fully adjust to political life. He did possess exceptional administrative skills that were developed through his experience as a military commander, but he didn't have the proper temperament needed to command the respect of the Senate and his subordinates in government. Thus, he would have the reputation of a vile person who would not receive the respect and honor of the kingdom, as did his predecessor, predecessor Augustus. Um, two quotations below will confirm this observation. And then... Um, to further develop an accurate character sketch of the vile attributes of Tiberius, we should understand that history portrays him as gradually, greatly deficient in self-confidence and slow to make decisions. He was not naturally amiable towards people and had trouble communicating effectively. 
His self-esteem would suffer further damage after he contracted a debilitating, disfiguring skin disease. And because Tiberius was also naturally sensitive to criticism, the constant worry of conspiracy coupled with his low self-esteem eventually drove him into a state of paranoia. And this would lead him to commit unspeakable acts of cruelty towards alleged seditionists. So he would eventually grow weary of Roman politics and decide to leave Rome permanently, retiring to the Isle of Capria, where he would finish out his remaining years and die of natural causes. Um, so, so we're going to have to come back to this uh, a bit more in detail. So I'm going to have to go through some of this history. Um, but with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. The phrase above would describe and confirm Tiberius's ruthful executions of many suspected conspirators. This subpassage could read, and with the arms of a flood, swift exacting judgment, so they, the conspirators against Tiberius, be overflown, removed from before him. Tiberius, that is from Tiberius, and shall be broken, executed. The execution of the Praetorian prefect Sejanus, seen by some historians as somewhat justifiable, is one particular example of the swift judgment and merciless brutality of Tiberius towards those whom he suspected of sedition. As a leader of the Praetorian Guard and protector of the emperor, Lucius Aelius Sejanus grew to become a close personal friend of Tiberius. Having the social status of a mere knight, he would boldly request a marriage alliance with the niece of Tiberius, Julia the Villa, an aristocrat, aristocrat yet the fear of senatorial reprisal from the marriage alliance between two distinct social classes moved Tiberius to reject this request. Even so, Sejanus would continue to consolidate his power by manipulating Tiberius's constant fear of sedition. He would use his influence with the emperor to eliminate most of his political opponents. Uh, after holding the consulate in concert with Tiberius in AD 31, Sejanus would later receive from the emperor himself both supreme authority over the military and permission to enter into the marriage alliance with Julia the villa that he had formally requested. Okay, so, so having established the context of his severity towards alleged conspirators, we can see that Tiberius would even cause the prince of the covenant to be broken. The Bible will clearly de demonstrate that the Prince of the Covenant is none other than Jesus Christ. And since Tiberius had served as emperor from AD 34 to 37, we can easily demonstrate through the 70-week prophecy of Daniel 9 that Christ was crucified during the reign of Tiberius. So we're familiar with that idea. So we're going to have to really take a look at this, right? And, and I just want to remind people, like we here... At this point, when we're, we're going through this, we're starting with with what we've been given, and we're trying to. I'm going to get rid of this because I don't think that would apply. Hey, see Theodore, how, yeah. you see that 483? Uh, 483 four, years. Well, 483 years. Yeah. What about it? <clears throat> I just it just caught my eye. I don't know. Yeah, so that's going to be just to the beginning of the 70th week, right? So the baptism of Christ in 27 AD, 483 years after the start of the 70th week. But uh, so it reminds you of, why is it catching your eye? Doesn't that go back to that number that uh, Bry brought up? Yes, it does. Right. That's what I was thinking it would be it anyway. I... Yes, that's the Hebrew number 483 and 4830 and the Greek number 483 and 4830. Yeah, that's yeah. what it, that's I what it, it about, caught my eye. Yeah, I was thinking about it at the time. And, and so that number comes from, uh, taking, uh, the last day of our camp meeting. What? Right. Right. Um, how did they do that? So July. <coughs> yeah. Uh, 23. So 4830. Yeah. So number relates to the 69 weeks. It is some caught my eye. I just. Yeah. And, I, and I, I think we should examine that at some point. Um, <clears throat> the context of all of this. But, uh, 
uh, we will we will come back to that. Okay. So I know we haven't figured anything out. Usually I like to have some, you know, at the end of each study, some kind of something clear that we have figured out. But, but we're still we're still looking at this, trying to understand it. Uh, not just the historical application, but also the application in our time, especially the application in our time. Okay, so any final comments before we close with prayer? Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study here this morning. We ask for your continued presence in our lives, in our personal study, Lord, that we can seek you and receive conviction and power. We pray for your angels' care and protection upon those that we love, and those that we minister to, and for ourselves as well. We need you in our lives, and um, um, we pray that we can be a blessing to those around us. Bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.